I'm Rosalind Bronstein of the Palm Springs Public Library's uh, Local History Project. Today is October 15, 1986. And I'm with Clarence Macy, a longtime Palm Springs resident. Clarence recently retired after 50 years as a theater projectionist, so he has many wonderful things to share with us. Clarence, although I've known you a long time, I really don't remember why your family came to Palm Springs and when they came. What year did you get here? Um, <clears throat> 1928. And my dad came here for work. And where did you come from? Uh, Pasadena. And when he came here, what kind of work did he find? Uh, he's a carpenter. He, he was sent here by a company that he had worked for before. So he came here to take a job. And did your family all come along at the same time, or did he come first? Uh, he came first. He was here for some time, and then he s sent for the family when he found it was pretty well established. How many of you were there when you, when all the Macy's assembled here? Uh, at that time, um, uh, my mother and dad, and uh, brother Jean, and uh, brother Charles, and <clears throat> myself, and my kid sister Peggy. And so he worked as a carpenter for uh, someone here? A man uh, well known in the area, uh, contractor uh, William Marty, built a lot of the buildings downtown. Uh, the the Lickin building was the first one they started on, uh, the, the old Palm Springs Hotel and the, and the Lickin building. <coughs> but um, uh, Carl Lickin was rebuilding, doing a real rebuild on that uh, building, which is now a historical site downtown. And uh, he worked on the the Palm Springs Hotel, which was being renovated from a, a little desert hotel into a, a fairly first-class hotel at that time. This has been almost 60 years ago, so it's uh, been remodeled many times, and now is completely gone. It's was that the Foldesee's Hotel? The old Foldesee Hotel, yeah. yeah. And uh, now it's the whatever they call that <laughs> thing downtown. <laughs> that thing. <laughs> Um, when you came, where did you live? First of all, I can remember we lived uh, directly across the street in the Palm Springs Hotel and the old um, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Grove, who are old timers. The building was moved to uh, Cathedral City and I think is still out there um, a long way over a, a dirt road at that time. But um, uh, we lived everywhere in town. There were little desert cabins. Um, nothing elaborate. There wasn't anything elaborate in town, but a little uh, desert cabins that had canvas uh, slot coverings for windows and uh, naturally no air conditioning, nothing. If you had a fan, you were lucky. But you did have electricity then. Electricity and uh, uh, the other conveniences, but um, uh, they were really primitive, all the little cabins, and they were all over town uh, uh, where the new fire station is. We lived there in what it was known as the, the uh, Pevler um, Court. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Pevler, who were really old timers, and he was such an interesting guy because he had been wounded in an Indian War fight. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we, uh, we also lived on uh, Section 14 which I'm very proud of now. In those days, I uh, said, oh, you're living on the campground. Uh, but we lived in the old Hatchets, uh, what we called Hatchets Campground. And I think uh, most of the old timers here in town at one time or another did live on the, the old reservation. Later, they began to call it Section 14. But um, the longest, uh, we lived in where the Village Theater was, it was not there at that time. They built that in 1932, but in the 20s we lived back behind there. Zaddy Bunker had uh, mm. a lot of um, little desert uh, cabins. But at that particular time, this was 1928-29, uh, she had at least to a man by the name of Beesmeyer. I remember this as a little kid anyway, the Beesmeyer building and loan collapse and uh, a lot of people went to jail. There was some fraud involved in the, in the thing. And then fortunately, at that time, the Palm Springs was just beginning to take off. And anyway, Zaddy Bunker got the property back. And she had a long-term lease on it to this organization. But uh, we paid our rent to the other organization before Zaddy got it back. And then uh, after uh, Earl and uh, uh, Francis were married, 
uh, Earl had started the theaters in the school auditorium. And, uh, so we're talking about Earl Streeby. Earl Streeby, yeah. And Frances was yeah. Eddie's daughter. Yeah, Frances Bunker. She was just uh, a young doctor uh, out of school, and uh, and she set up practice here in town. She was in her in her 20s. Mm -hmm. and. Um, Earl married her, and uh, I guess she practiced for a while after he married her, and then um, uh, started to raise a family, and I don't think she ever, she didn't practice anymore. But she was a young girl in her 20s. Earl was, oh, I guess 22, 23 when I first knew him. He's now almost 80, or he, he is 80 now. So uh, our relationship goes back a few years. But um, they built a theater there in 1932, and um, uh, I went away to school, no high school in Palm Springs. And uh, I went to Redlands High School. Uh, most of the kids went to Banning High School. My dad had a ranch outside of uh, Redlands in Yucapa Valley. And so I went uh, to Redlands High School and then came back and um, uh, the Plaza Theater was about ready to open in 1936. And I got the job at the Village Theater as a movie operator, which is the only thing I ever wanted to do. Uh, I had started with Earl at the uh, old school auditorium uh, when I was just uh, a kid. The, the place, fa the projection room is still there, and, and the auditorium, Everybody's Village, is, is still there. And I would look up those stairs, and that's the only thing I ever wanted to do. And I worked my way in. There were no power rewinds in those days. I started rewinding film by hand, and little by little, Earl taught me uh, how to run the show, and that gave him more time downstairs because he was. Uh, uh, managing and doing everything he had to uh, to operate a theater. He was just a kid. He was a bell hopping in a hotel, too, at the same time, during the daytime, running a theater at night. Was this and the first theater in town, then, when it was run at the... Uh it, it, it was the first commercial theater. I understand that Earl Kaufman did run uh, movies over in the Desert Inn mm -hmm. and that sort of thing, but um, it was... The, the, and it was a flat civic auditorium, so Saturday nights they ran dances in there. And um, it was noisy, and uh, they they didn't have sound the first year that I got involved. And what uh, year was that? About 1929, I think. We were a little uh, late getting sound movies. And about 1929, 1930, Earl uh, got sound. The financial part of the thing is interesting. Here was a kid that uh, had a lot of personality, had hitchhiked into town, got a job as a bellhop, and. Uh, met a man at the uh, Desert Inn who, here was a kid with a lot of personality and who looked like he was going places, and, uh, and Earl has told me this, I'm not telling any tales <laughs> out of school. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, he was involved with the McKesson Drug Company and uh, financed Earl, and uh, the first financing I think was about $12,000, $12,500 for the new sound equipment and projection equipment that they had to have. and. Um, a very dear friend of mine uh, was also a bellhop in a hotel and was uh, doing the, the projection work for Earl when the new sound system came in. And uh, they ran a movie the first night and the next day they were running some sort of a special showing. And in those days the film was so dangerous. It was a nitrate film and uh, anyway they had bad fire and all this brand new equipment. And uh, anyway Ralph was burned a little uh, uh, and didn't operate any that year, and Earl took over the movie operating himself, so consequently that's how I got into the uh, projection room. And, uh, little by little he taught me, and uh, he could stay away from the booth longer and longer periods of time, and I would stand on my tiptoes and run shows. So and you were what, 11 years old? I was, uh, I was about 11 or 12 along in there, and uh, 1929 I was 11 years old, and uh, anyway, uh, when a movie came along that was a, a good thing for the kids to see, an appropriate movie, Catherine Finchie, Miss Finchie, was the greatest gal. She did so many things out of, you know, above and beyond for the kids. If a movie came along, she would ask Earl, uh, could we run it for the kids? I can remember one movie, Bird at the South Pole, which was, uh, you know, at that time, a, a good uh, travel and whatnot. Anyway, Earl, um, she would call Earl, Earl would call her and get me out of class so I could go up and prepare for the movie. And I got to run the movie for the kids. And why he ever did this, I'll never know, because I wouldn't go in a projection room that had a reel of nitrate film in it. Now I would be scared to death. 
And uh, although down through the years until after World War II, we ran millions of feet of, uh, of nitrate film. Mm -hmm. Very explosive and very dangerous. But he, uh, and the equipment was dangerous. It was not, there were no safety devices to speak of on the equipment in those days. And uh, yet he let me run. He, he would take a chance. That's why he's an extremely wealthy man today. He's, he will take a chance on, on people and, and uh, things. I'd like to talk a little bit about your school experience. You you were about 10 years old when you moved started here. Started 10 years old. And so you started right into Francis Stevens School. Francis Stevens School, and uh, I was in the uh, in the fifth grade, and because of a half year mix up, I was a, a dummy. I was a first half kid in a second half class, so consequently I took that second half. Anyway, uh, the next year, one of the most magnificent teachers I've ever met. If you ask any kid that ever went to school at Francis Stevens who sticks out in their mind as the most outstanding, they'll say Florence Newberry. Miss Newberry, uh, I was in her class the first year she was here. She was a gal in her 40s, I guess, had never been married, but was she a real <laughs> Joel? And so smart. I was a real smart kid. I had been there and she was a newcomer. We had cloakrooms behind the, the classes the first day she was there. And anyway, I didn't realize she had disappeared from the front of the class, and I was smarting off in the back of the class. And the next thing I knew, I was on the floor next to the seat. From then on, she had come up behind me and let me have it. From then on, uh, years after I got out of school, I was married. We were the closest friends. She was, and I think every kid that went to that school probably has some sort of an experience with it. Magnificent. Catherine Finchie, don't ever sell her short. She was a tough old bird and she ran a tight ship, but um, it was a really happy ship. Uh, those were the happiest days of any kid's life up there, but uh, it was tough and Miss Finchie was the boss and we all knew it, but she went, uh, as I say, above and beyond so many times to do so many things for us and um, we must have gotten an education because um, we survived. And so you, you went to school till eighth grade? Eighth grade, that uh, was Catherine Finchie and from eighth and you had to go on either to Banning or many of the kids went to uh, private schools and um, I think a few had an opportunity to go what they called the um, smoke tree school out here. A private school? Yeah, it was it was a private school, and uh, I guess you could, uh, because I I think I remember a few that went, but most of the kids rode the bus to Banning or went to Banning and stayed um, in private homes for the week, because that was a miserable trip in those days. It was a little narrow road, and uh, the bus was always breaking down. Uh, sometimes on purpose, and uh, they sabotage that bus. Uh, but you would get, you know, the road was full of dips, and it was just a two-lane narrow road, and you get behind a hay truck going five miles an hour, and you sat there because you couldn't pass because of the dips in the road. A car would pop up in front of you, and it was a, and it was a lot farther in those days too. You went up by the railroad station north of town, and then you turned north and went to. A, what they called the Highway 99, and then from then on it was, um, as I say, up uh, a steep grade for any kind of equipment. And um, so rather than have the kids ride that bus up there and back, it was about 25 miles in those days, mm -hmm. at least 25 miles. They, uh, a lot of the kids, my brothers and, uh, or not my sister, she was younger than I, but my two older brothers stayed in Banning in private homes with people who are um, still friends, you know, mm -hmm. well-known, the, the kids are here in, in the area. You had said that uh, to me that many of the, the children who went to Francis Stevens also had to be transported because they came from all over the valley. How did they get yeah. here? Well, th there weren't many. Um, I remember uh, one kid from out here at Edom, which is now Thousand Palms, uh, that was a railroad designation, I think, Edom and uh, railroad telegraphers kids. Mm -hmm. uh, I know there was one from there and there was one from the uh, uh, the depot out in the north end of town and I think there were a couple of uh, kids came from Garnett, north of town, but they had to come by way of the old uh, Highway 99 uh, and come across uh, at Whitewater and then from Whitewater we did pick up some kids too. That's where the old bus came in. Yeah. They had, they had one bus, I'll tell it for her 
benefit. <laughs> this Model T Ford was about the most underpowered thing in the world. A Model T Ford was anyway, but they put this big bus body on this thing. At one time, it was so top heavy that I think the wind blew it over and <laughs> up, up in, the, in the pass. And um, anyway, they would park that thing on the playground and everything was deep sand at that time. And every day, a bunch of us mean little kids would get out there and this guy would get in his bus, get his kids in there. And we would sneak in behind the bushes and grab that bus and hold on and dig in. And this guy, and if you know anything about a Model T Ford, it had three pedals on the floor and you'd push on that one pedal to get it going and it would go, <laughs> and that bus wouldn't move. <laughs> it wouldn't move. And we would do that until we got tired and, or we would be laughing so hard we couldn't do it anymore. And then we'd let the poor guy go. But I don't think he ever caught on what we were doing to his bus. He just felt that bus was so underpowered he couldn't get it going. But I can name some of the kids. I know Earl Neal. Now Neal's nursery out here. I'm sure Ted McKinney was in on this because Ted didn't miss a thing. And Jimmy Maynard, Jimmy Maynard's name will come up in Palm Springs, the most magnificent kid in the world. Uh, but I'm sure that Jimmy was in on that. But uh, we did it. <laughs> <laughs> and you had said that some, some children came from Cathedral City. Right. Uh, a Mrs. Crunkleton uh, had a car that, and she brought in her own two kids, Edith and Buster, Charles Crunkleton, and I think the Craig boys came in with her, and um, I'm darned if I remember, but I think she brought about six kids in with her each day, and that was Dirt Road, over the Dirt Road from Cathedral City into, um, into Palm Springs each day. And uh, the rest of the kids walked, and uh, some of them walked quite a a distance uh, to go to school. But there really wasn't, you know, we were pretty, uh, it was a small town. Uh, the road stopped at Indian Avenue. It was open desert from Indian Avenue out. Indian Avenue was a dirt street. Uh, Ramon Road was uh, nothing. It was just a little ro road out to what we called the dump at the time. The city dump was up on the other side of Sunrise Way uh, which has been Ramon Trailer Park maybe for 45 years or so now. But uh, that's where the, the city dump was. When you talk about the city dump, it reminds me of a story that you told me about a pig farm that was oh, yeah. here in Palm Springs. Spalletti's Pig Farm. Spalletti's Pig Farm was just off El Segundo on, uh, on the reservation. And Spalletti also uh, had the garbage collection uh, franchise here in town, <laughs> and the uh, I I don't know when. Uh, of course, the town wasn't incorporated until 1938, so I don't know what our collection setup was uh, uh, up until 38. But I know Spalletti had it, and I know he had pigs uh, out there. Uh, Spalletti was an Italian guy married to one of the Indian women, and that's how he uh, got settled on on the reservation. At that time, the reservation was uh, was really a reservation. I remember it had a barbed wire fence around it uh, from Ramon Road to uh, Alejo. had a, a barbed wire fence and uh, had signs on there, no firearms, no liquor allowed on the reservation. And for a very good reason, um, Indians weren't good drinkers. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a federal law. And uh, it was prohibition times, uh, naturally, up until 1932. and. Uh, but there was always booze around, and the Indians always managed to find it. I can remember going out on the on the desert and under a greasewood tree, tree finding practically a whole case of vanilla bottles empty, and some Indian had been drinking vanilla because of the alcoholic content, and uh, they go crazy, absolutely nuts. I, gu I guess the younger group can drink and get away with it, but mm -hmm. some of the old uh, Indians could just could not drink. Did you have many friends in school who were Indians when you came here? Yeah, the number one Indian friend of mine was Joe uh, Potencio. And uh, this guy was just one of those magnificent people. Uh, uh, I tell you a strange thing, when you find that you've worked on a job too long, I left uh, the Village Theater about 1977 and uh, was transferred to the Camelot Theater. And a little girl who was not a teenager, but she was about uh, I'd say in her 20s, 
who worked at the Camelot Theater came to the projection room and we got to talking and I found she was early uh, uh, Indian and uh, I asked her if she knew Joe Potencio and she said yes he's my grandfather that's when you find you have <laughs> and this was a kid I went to school with and I'm working with his granddaughter and she was in her 20s so you've been around long enough that's great there as long as we're talking about this thing of trash collection, what do you remember about police? When was the first, uh, your first recollection of, of police? Oh, sure, I remember them real well. We had no, uh, <clears throat> no police department. We were county, and uh, we did have one deputy sheriff, and his name was Mr. Dodd. And he was such a nice guy. He was great for, uh, to all of us kids. He was a real sweet guy. Of course, he didn't have much to do. Arrest a drunk Indian once in a while, but... <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Dodd, and then we had a, a, a man by the name of Prater, who was still uh, um, a deputy sheriff. And then we had a fellow, this gets into the airport thing. There was a fellow running the airport, flying instructor at the airport by the name of Bill Seaton, who um, was a World War I flyer, and he was instructing at the, uh, at the Palm Springs Airport for a, um, an organization out of San Diego called AirTech and um, uh, they just, it was a subsidiary of the, uh, of the San Diego operation and uh, he handled uh, the Palm Springs thing and I get, I don't know whether the, this was depression, the depression started, I would say it hit us about um, 1930 or so here in Palm Springs and um, uh, Bill Seaton naturally he was my idol because I hung around the airport as a little kid all the time and uh, Bill uh, somehow or other became um, the uh, police officer. Now this was before incorporation. I don't know whether we had a police department or whether we were still a Riverside County Sheriff's Department, but Bill Seaton was the uh, uh, chief of police here in, in town. And um, gosh, I, I could probably name some more of them, but Bill was a especially good friend of mine, so, uh, but he was tough. <laughs> you didn't get away with anything with him. But anyway, he was, uh, he first, uh, I first heard of him at the airport, and then he came on. But the incorporation took place, I believe, do you know any figures, April 1938? Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think that I made the first public announcement. We had no radio stations in Palm Springs, nothing. If you were lucky, you could pick up uh, KFI out of L.A. and uh, Static, and uh, we didn't have a radio. I know that. My folks didn't. And anyway, uh, uh, getting back to the Goff family, and uh, Dawson Goff, wife, worked for the theater as secretary. She typed up a slide and brought it into the projection room the night we incorporated, and I threw it on the screen for the public to see. And I, it was probably the first public announcement that Palm Springs had voted to incorporate in uh, 1938. And I heard um, uh, Phil Boyd who was, I believe Phil Boyd was the first mayor of Palm Springs, uh, say the reason we incorporated was to, um, I heard him say it at a, at a historical society meeting, the reason we incorporated Palm Springs was to beat the, uh, the illegal gambling going on. Uh, we had, uh, I think, three clubs going on in, in Cathedral City and um, the best people. Uh, what I mean, Al Wertheimer ran one, uh, Joe Portnoy was, uh, or Frank Portnoy was involved, Joe Portnoy was his kid brother who was involved, and um, they were the, uh, a, a decent bunch of people. Uh, when the chips were down and somebody was in trouble, they were the first to go to their aid. But anyway, they, uh, they felt that uh, gambling should uh, not be here, and uh, gambling was being done. I'm sure uh, someone was being paid off. Uh, I feel it was Riverside County Sheriff, should I say that? So where were the clubs? So they weren't in Palm Springs, were they? One of the clubs is on Date Palm, you know where the 7-Eleven, just north of Kmart. Mm -hmm. The foundation is still sitting there, there's a vacant lot. That was the Dunes Club, the big one. Mm. That was the Al Wertheimer organization. Uh, George Streeby, who uh, this, all everything entwines. George Streeby, who is Earl Streeby's younger brother, was married to Al Wertheimer's daughter. Uh, Joyce Wertheimer and uh, George also uh, uh, worked naturally for his father-in-law and uh, uh, but they were all uh, pretty decent people at that time Date Palm Drive was just a short drive up from Cathedral City so there was no road going north 
uh, date palm was not complete. And the club, uh, I understand, had a, um, a, uh, a front, naturally, mm -hmm. which was the dining room and whatnot. And then the back rooms were, were gambling. Then uh, right in uh, Cathedral City, uh, now so somebody is going to be able to tell you a lot about this. This is just what I know and what comes off mm -hmm. the top. Earl Saucer was another one of the um, uh, owners of one of the clubs, and it had a number, I don't know what, but there were three clubs. 123 or something. Something like that, that yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, uh, they, uh, those clubs, two of them, I think, operated right off the main street in, uh, in Cathedral City. But the Dunes Club was, uh, and then later Al Wertheimer um, opened the Dunes uptown in Palm Springs, which um, later became, uh, yeah, it became Ruby Dunes. Oh. And that particular building goes back to the old Harry Matasio uh, restaurant, and it was a pool hall back in the early days. And um, oh. uh, so all of these things uh, come together. Uh, Harry, uh, Harry Matascio, uh, have you uh, interviewed Harry yet? Yeah. Well, he's a treat. He's 90 years old and a super person. But um, he, uh, he at one time owned the Palm Springs Hotel and he also owned the, uh, uh, what was later uh, Ruby Dunes and uh, which is now a nightclub sort of thing up, uptown. But that building is really, and it's the original building. I've been anxious to, to talk with you about aviation because I know that you've been mad about airplanes all your life and I want you to tell me about the first yeah. airport here. Okay, the first airport that I used to walk up that dirt road just to peek in the windows of, of the hangar see what's going on was on Indian Avenue north of the El Mirador Hotel running east and west north uh, about where uh, uh, Paseo El Mirador is now just a little bit north of that or maybe right on 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 line with it but they had a hangar there and um, uh, flew a lot of the planes from Marchfield and San Diego used to come in there and a fellow by the name of Wesley Gray who is from the original Gray family who owned the Central Hotel and the Central Hotel Annex which later became the uh, the Royal Palms on the on uh, the east side of the street, the, on the west side of the street, the Central Hotel was incorporated into the uh, uh, old Chichi, uh, Irwin Shulman's uh, Chichi, and some of the buildings up until the time uh, they uh, uh, demolished everything to put in the new project down there, um, some of the uh, uh, original wood buildings from the Central Hotel were still there, and uh, the rooms were being used by um, uh, by the help. Uh, from uh, what I mean, busboys and mm -hmm. things like that lived in uh, in uh, in the old wood structure. Do you have a pi you showed me that a picture? Do you yeah. have that picture? I wonder if we could get it on camera. Well, I, I don't know whether it'll show. Well, let's try. I don't know whether it'll show it's or not. A wonderful picture of uh, uh, the Almirador Hotel. And that's yeah. This is the uh, uh, this is the picture. How you're going to show that? I don't I'm know. I'm not sure. If um, the camera will will pick that up, but if it will, then maybe you could kind of show yeah, us where. Yeah, let me see your uh, pencil. Do you have a pencil there handy? Mm -hmm. I, I do. Yeah. Now here, this is the El Mirador complex. This is Indian Avenue running right up there, this little dirt road. There is the hangar for the airport, and there is an old biplane sitting on the field. Across the street is what I think we call the Stevens track. It was just, you can see the ground has just been scratched. But this is the El Mirador. This is the main building, uh, the uh, lobby, and the tower is there. Uh, these are the two structures that uh, later became uh, uh, hospital units when it was Attorney General Hospital and Palm Springs Hospital. Uh, there is the swimming pool. Uh, this area right here now is about the entrance of the new uh, uh, desert hospital. But the uh, uh, Palm Canyon runs over on this other street but uh, the, the hangar sticks out very well. And uh, that was uh, the offices and, um, and uh, hangar for the aircraft that, uh, that Wesley Gray ran. Here, here's a shot, maybe you can get a shot of Wes Gray. This should be shown, because he is an old timer and a pioneer aviator. He died at the age of, uh, oh, about 85, uh, uh, oh, maybe five years ago. I talked to him on the phone just shortly before he died, a matter of a year or two. But he was in his 20s at this particular time, and he died uh, in his 
Oh gosh, he must have been in his late twenties, and he died at about the age of eighty-four, or so eighty-five. But this this particular airplane was a Navy uh, training plane out of San Diego, and uh, no brakes, had a spare tire they carried on him, and uh, he had befriended a bunch of Navy pilots. Here, here is another one showing the hotel. Um, there is the hotel in the background, and here is one of the Navy planes and another one. There is an old OX-5 International to anyone that is, goes that far back in aviation. But these particular airplanes, now I'll tell you a little story about Wes. This guy, uh, he was a good friend of mine. I flew with him later. I was just a little, little kid when this took place. But um, I flew with him on the Section 14 airport, the old dirt field uh, that closed when World War II started. In fact the day the war started, that's when we shut our airplanes. Now, I had an airplane on the field at that time, and we were grounded automatically. And uh, then the military started using the uh, the new airport. Although the first day uh, that we got into the war, they, uh, when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, they flew a lot of bombers down off uh, um, the, the fields in L.A. Uh, uh, North American B-25s came in here uh, to get them off the coast because they didn't know what was going to happen. And um, so there were some airplanes uh, at the beginning of World War II that used the old dirt field just very shortly. But um, Wes uh, flew off the, the, the dirt field later, uh, not commercially, but um, he had several airplanes that, uh, uh, that he flew for business and fun. And he, uh, but anyway, to get back to the original airport, um, he, he had these Navy friends, and he got into a battle with P.T. Stevens, who owned the El Mirador Hotel. Uh, either P.T. or the management, I think it was Warren Penny at that time, were giving him a rough time about this airport being here because of the dust and the sand. Well, you can, I can <laughs> understand why. But anyway, they wanted him out of there. And uh, he invited a group of his friends with these airplanes down, and it was all sand. And he turned the he got them to turn the airplanes around and warm the airplanes up, and they gave the Elmer Door Hotel the worst dust job you ever saw. <laughs> but he was he was an honorary cuss. This guy was was um, but a real great guy. He uh, and a real uh, real flyboy too. He could fly airplanes. He flew with all the original people. Uh, he'd be at the airport, and some of these old pros would come in that he had known for years. Uh, the Western Airlines Group, the first airline in the United States. Uh, uh, they lost a pilot by the name of Maury Graham, uh, uh, and he was lost all winter, and they found him the, the next spring. Uh, you're trying to fly the, the mail through the, mm. through uh, storms. He was lost up in, uh, oh, Utah or someplace. Anyway, it was the original Salt Lake City to Los Angeles run, which I, th I think was the first, uh, uh, the beginning of Western Airlines, mm. which is was the original airline in the United States. Anyway, Maury Graham was a, a friend of his. He had flown with him, and uh, he knew, uh, uh, so many of the the guy was a real fly guy. It was such an interesting. You, you don't find them anymore, and most of them are gone now. And you said there were so many other famous aviators who came through. This this was the original. The only famous woman flyer that I remember who is still alive today was Bobby Trout. I remember she was on that field, and I think she's out here in Palm Desert somewhere. Uh, she was a great friend of uh, of Clima Granger, who mm -hmm. was one of the. They were these women were original 99ers, mm. um, who were with Amelia Earhart and the original 99 that uh, that formed the 99er club. But no, that airport was the first one. Then, P. T. Stevens built uh, an airport that ran north and south out where the Raymond Cree Junior High School is mm. now. Uh, and they had two hangars there. They found that was a poor location. In the meantime, they got Wes out of his field. He was a pain in the neck to all of them. One time, I'll tell you a strange story. A guy by the name of Tuttle, who was involved in the movie industry, was being taught to fly. Uh, and I, I don't know whether Wes was teaching him to fly, but he was flying an old Jenny, which was a World War I plane. And anyway, he got almost out to the new airport, which was running north and south uh, on um, Caballeros, is that the street? Anyway, um, an engine failure and spun the thing in and almost got one of the airplanes on the other field, their rivals. Uh, anyway, uh, West went out of business up there and they moved that airport. Uh, that's when this Bill Seaton came in with AirTech and they moved the two hangars down to uh, the corner of Alejo and uh, Caballeros, about. Um, Anyway, that was the northwest corner of the airport. Then it ran diagonally down to what is now uh, McCallum and um, 
or Tokwitz, which it would be on the reservation, so it would be Tokwitz and um, Sunrise Way, and that's where it ended up. Uh, a diagonal 3,300 foot runway, and that is when the aviation thing really got off the ground here in Palm Springs. Um, the airlines used it as an emergency field. In fact, American Airlines had lights on it uh, for a uh, nighttime emergency. And when the weather got bad, the airlines didn't fly. If they did, they ended up in the side of a mountain, as a general mm -hmm. rule. Uh, so consequently, when the weather got real bad on the coast, they would land in, in Palm Springs, coming you know from this direction, rather than, uh, I imagine Palmdale got a lot of them coming in mm -hmm. from the other direction. But about what uh, year would that airport have been? That airport was built uh, just about 19, uh, 29, 30 was when that airport was built, when they moved it to section 14. And it stayed there until the day the war started, uh, 1941. But in in that period of time, um, some of the most, uh, well, uh, the Amelia Earharts and people like that. I saw Amelia Earhart on the field shortly before she was lost in 1937. And uh, the one I know you want to know about is Wiley Post, who was probably, uh, he was of the Lindbergh era. In 1930, they came in, um, uh, a friend of mine uh, took care of the field downtown, a fellow by the name of Joe Omlin, who is also a family that's well known here in town. Uh, Joe Omlin ran the Desert Inn garage. We had our new fire truck, which we got after <laughs> our grocery store burned down. We got a brand new fire truck, and uh, they kept it in the garage. And I always felt that Joe was appointed, he was the custodian because he had the keys to the garage, <laughs> but uh, I don't think he was actually the first fire chief, although he may have been. But Billy Anasio, who became fire chief, who built the fire department here in Palm Springs, uh, Bill was uh, one of the young guys in that group who later, when we incorporated, became um, uh, the first fire chief under incorporation, I'm sure mm -hmm. of that. But anyway, uh, Joe Omlin lived next door to us, back about the spot where the Village Theater <coughs> eventually ended up. And um, Joe hollered at me one evening after the sun had gone down, it was getting dark, and he said, you want to go to the airport? Because he knew I was nuts. And I was about uh, 1930, I was about 12 years old then, and, and boy, I hop in his car and we go out there, here's this great big white monoplane with a strange name inscribed on, on the, in small letters on, on the uh, back towards the tail on the fuselage. Anyway, these two fellows, uh, one guy had a patch over his eye, Wiley Post, and the other was Harold Gaddy, his navigator, who is still alive, I believe, in Australia today. But anyway, uh, uh, we helped them tie the airplane down, and uh, they got in the car. Wally Post rode in the front seat, and Harold Gaddy in the back seat with me. And they wanted to know the cheapest hotel in town, which was the La Palma Hotel. We dropped them off there. And then the next morning, they, uh, they hauled out fairly early uh, for L.A. when the fog and whatnot cleared. And uh, then uh, that was, well, that was along in May or June. And then that August, big black headlines, Post and Gaddy, uh, set a new record uh, in the world flight, flew around the world. And from then on, Wiley Post was, uh, later in life, he was killed with Will Rogers up in, um, in Alaska. Mm -hmm. They uh, had an engine failure and, um, and spun it in up there, and, and both were killed at Point Barrow in, in Alaska. But Wiley Post today, uh, you ask anybody, and they know who Wiley Post was. He did things that, um, that uh, uh, you know, were way above the years, like, trying to fly stratosphere with a, uh, a uh, sealed suit on. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, uh, he, Amelia Earhart, I think of uh, some of the uh, that, uh, fellows like Tex Rankin, who was probably, the, well, he was the world's uh, greatest aerobatic champion at one time, and a super nice guy who we talked to a lot, uh, a guy from Texas, uh, and uh, a real down-to-earth uh, uh, human being. Uh, but of the movie crowd, if you want to know them, uh, this was the in thing with the movie crowd at that time. Some of the, the really good flyers, I remember Wally Berry was a super pilot. Uh, Bob Cummings was a very good pilot. Brian Ahern, uh, Robert Taylor learned to fly on the old dirt field. He was soloed by a real close friend of mine. And uh, Jimmy Stewart did a lot of flying, and uh, Henry King, the uh, movie director, and uh, of course, Howard Hughes, we saw an awful lot of Howard Hughes in those days. He um, flew uh, in, well, he spent a lot of time, he liked Palm Springs, he spent a lot of time here, and uh, gosh, that he... before he was so much of a recluse? Oh, oh, yes, he, oh, but he was a strange person. Uh, you, you didn't, um, 
walk up and start talking to Howard Hughes. Even when, when he would come to the airport with a group, he would stand back and, uh, uh, but the guy could fly an airplane. That, that was a number, you know, you hear so many things. The guy made uh, millions of dollars and this and that, and he made movies and things. But to me, this guy was a good pilot. Mm -hmm. He could fly, uh, and he flew everything that, uh, that he had built. He flew it himself. Uh, he had a race plane uh, that uh, held the world speed record, and he did the te original test flying on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he was getting ready, he broke uh, a Wiley Post record for around the world flight. I, d I don't know who holds that now. I'm sure that that record has been broken, but he did a lot of his training out of here. And I can remember one day, the fellow that ran the, the airport, a uh, fellow by the name of Gus Parrish, uh, who I still see on occasion. He was here at the house uh, a year or two ago. Uh, Gus comes out and he sees this DC-2, which was one of the original uh, of the DC airplanes, mm -hmm. uh, sees it sitting parked. Howard Hughes had come in the night before, parked the airplane, gotten in another airplane and took off somewhere. And then maybe the airplane sat there for weeks and, and you can't move a big airplane like that. And here, Gus would get so, uh, this guy Howard Hughes would do some of the darndest things. Uh, rather than park the thing way out where it, it should be parked, park it almost on the runway. Anyway, I remember that DC-2 sat out there. But what he was doing, he was training for this round-the-world flight. Mm -hmm. And I think he and about three or four or five other fellows, four maybe, uh, did this round-the-world flight and, uh, and set a new record. And Howard Hughes <coughs> was well known from, uh, from then on, his, his record-breaking, uh, his uh, flying of the race plane, which uh, uh, he engineered, uh, the guy was a super brain, there's a, no getting around. And in those days he was uh, uh, a real normal human being. He didn't become a uh, recluse until way after World War II. But Most of the other stars, were they more uh, easy to approach? Oh, very easy, all of them. Uh, I tell you, one of the super nice guys, you remember Amos and Andy, the mm -hmm. old original. Mm -hmm. uh, Charlie Carell was, uh, I believe he was the, the Andy part. Anyway, he was just one of the guys at the airport. And Edgar Bergen was too. Edgar Bergen, uh, uh, years later, used to come to see me in the projection room, up until uh, just shortly before he died. But uh, Edgar Bergen was a very good pilot and had a lot of airplanes. And uh, we were going over the number of airplanes up in the booth one, one night that he, that he had owned. and. Uh, but uh, the same old story, you get up to a certain age and uh, the high blood pressure and whatnot, he couldn't uh, retain his license, so he had to give it up. But uh, he and I remember the, the little girl uh, who is now the dreamy Candace Bergen uh, uh, used to be with him on occasion. But um, uh, of the nice people, uh, oh, I, I could, if I could think of them, there's so many just really uh, nice gang that uh, when they were flying and when you knew them uh, at the airport, they were just super nice people. Did most of them have homes here? Is that what brought them to this airport? I don't know where they had homes here, but they spent a lot of time here, a lot of, a lot of time. And Paul, uh, Paul Lucas, too, uh, mm -hmm. was, uh, he was a World War I flyer, I believe, from Romania. Mm -hmm. Does that ring a bell? I think he was a Romanian, but he was World War One pilot, and uh, he he did uh, oh for years flew in and out of the old dirt field, and um, you have to respect these guys uh, when they are really good pilots. They know their stuff, and uh, this the movie crowd seemed to be uh, just darn good pilots, all of them. Uh, it was the end thing. Uh, to go back to the real end thing. I can remember, and this will ring a bell if you know the history, Mary Astor coming in uh, in a, what we would classify as a real antique now, but I remember seeing her at the, uh, at the old dirt field. Hmm. And then uh, some of the real famous of the, of the test pilots, the, um, an interesting thing out of, um, he was here for his health, uh, a fellow by the name of Marshall Heedle, I think he did, he was, did the original test flying on the P-38 before World War II. This goes back uh, into the earlier days before. The P-38 had just been flown, but they had um, done a strange thing with him on some test work. They had put him in a chamber and run him up to high altitude and he ran out of oxygen and they dropped him and um, uh, very rapidly an aeroembolism and mm -hmm. it damaged his heart so bad. They had him here in Palm Springs, but the Lockheed people would fly in here with, uh, with their fleet of doctors to take care of him. But he couldn't stay away from the airport. He was around mm. the airport. And um, uh, here was a guy that uh, was probably one of the best test pilots in the, in the country and had flown this 
a really hot airplane at that particular time, and the airplane had a lot of faults yet, uh, uh, you know, parts coming off and things like that. Uh, so it took a lot of, lot of nerve to fly an airplane like that. But he was so super. I remember one day I heard a, a, a loud, like an earthquake, and the door shook and whatnot. And I went to the airport a short time later, and the guys at the field said the P-38 had just gone in out here. And uh, it was in the wash. Um, two P-38s out of Marchfield um, uh, had peeled off into a dive and then heading back up the pass. And one of them didn't come out. He hit the ground at about a 45-degree angle at the highest speed that that you're going. An aer airplane blew in a, a million pieces. And anyway, I went. Out, I had an airplane on the field at the time. I went out and landed next to it. And a couple of other fellows with airplanes had flown out there too. And we landed in the wash. Uh, it hit uh, just north of town. Oh, about where those uh, radio antennas are out in the, in the wash. Now, anyway, we got back to the field, and we were talking about the P-38, and boy, that son of a gun was a dangerous hot airplane. And Marshall Heedle was there, and he says, no, uh, he says, that's not. He says, that is, you know, uh, to the person flying the P-38, they would like to have everybody think that they ha you have to be a super pilot to fly one. Uh, that was the impression they tried to give. But Marshall Heedle, who had done the original flying, said, no, that is not right at all. He said, you see that cub sitting out there? He says, that airplane is just as easy to fly as that cub. Uh, he says the only thing wrong with it is the fact when you get them in a the dive, they get a little nose heavy and you have to start your pull out sooner. But anyway, uh, uh, he was one of the, he died shortly afterwards. He didn't, it didn't survive this thing. Maybe today uh, he could have done something. But he was, um, uh, and uh, Milo Burcham, who um, was one of the top, t uh, not only test pilot, he flew for Lockheed, but uh, he was also one of the aerobatic pilots in the country. Uh, at that time, he uh, he was killed in one of our first uh, uh, P-80s, which was one of the first jets that we ever had out of Lockheed. Now, well, they they closed the the airport down in '41, the day the the day the war started, for all intents and purposes, except they didn't catch some of us. Uh -huh. <laughs> the airplane, the airport had closed. We still had airplanes on the field, and uh, the field was closed, but um, uh, a, a couple of us did some flying. <laughs> Not high, but low flying. Now, who ran the tower and all? Oh, there was no such thing. No such thing. Uh, when, when the Army Air Base first started out here, they, uh, it had a tower, mm -hmm. a wooden structure that the guys had to climb to get up to. And uh, strangely, I knew uh, two of the guys that worked in the tower, and they were real characters. Uh, one of them was, uh, it was Laurel and Hardy. And, uh, and poor Laurel, every time something would happen, if he had an airplane ground loop or he lost a plane while he was in the tower, the rest of them would jump on him and say, you wrecked another airplane for us. And, but, uh, but it was a fun thing. But, but they, the Army Air Corps in those days, before we had Army Air Force, uh, the Army Air Corps uh, had their own tower and uh, operated it with... Uh, uh, these guys were civilians, civilian so operation. what year are we talking? We're talking 1941, when the war first started. And um, uh, they used the tower until the end of World War II, and then the tower shut down. We didn't have a tower on this field until, uh, no, I, I couldn't even guess, but I had uh, an airplane on the field after World War II, and um, uh, there was no tower there until, oh gosh, it had to be in the, I, I would say, in the 60s when they put a tower. And, and you're talking about the present location. That's the present, that's the old Army Air Base which is now um, the Palm Springs Airport. But the, the, the old dirt field, uh, uh, as I say, closed in uh, the day the war started uh, in 1941. There was no more flying off it because the new one was under construction and was just about ready to, uh, to go in operation anyway. And uh, it couldn't have been open uh, on the, the day the war started because they did fly some B-25s into the old dirt field to get them off the coast. So the Air Corps was here for that period of time. I understand that they housed um, prisoners of war here too during World War II. Th that, that was up on the uh, Attorney General Hospital area. Uh, they had German PWs and they also had uh, Italian PWs up there. But uh, th that had to do with the hospital. The, the airport was run, the Air Transport Command, I believe, and then it was a, a, a training facility. Mm. Uh, some of the fellows that I flew with before the war also went into the Air Transport Command. Uh, I know they had a training facility because one of, uh, a friend of mine was um, 
uh, instructing, uh, oh, they were doing transition into, into fighter planes and also they were given instrument work. And one day, uh, this one friend of mine uh, w went to the commanding officer on the base and complained about someone cutting him off coming in. And uh, he, the, the commanding officer said, well, that can be done in case of emergency. And the guy says, well, he's out there flying. And he says, that is a student pilot. That was an emergency. Anytime he got in the airplane, it was an emergency. <laughs> and so uh, uh, they, d they did have uh, training facilities out there. They had some pretty good accidents on, on, uh, on this field. If, if you go for accidents, uh, I remember uh, one day uh, a couple of P P-51s collided uh, right over the field, a buzz in the field together. One of them pulled up and the other one uh, mm. didn't. And anyway, the guy bailed and lit right, the airplane lit right here in this track, in the veterans track. And uh, he parachuted out with the other fellow in, into the ground. Uh, we had one accident here that um, took place, I think in October of, of, of 42. In the evenings, they brought the, all the planes in off the coast. For one reason, they got them uh, into Palm Springs so they could get out going east before the fog, uh, out of the fog on the coast. And then uh, at the beginning of the war, it was because they wanted to get, clear the fields on the coast because of Japanese attack. Mm -hmm. And uh, one night, about five o'clock, they were, all the bombers were hitting town and the, and the fighter planes and everything at one time. And it was a wild melee around here. Uh, they would hit town all at the same time and uh, uh, fly in all different directions and uh, land at, at the field. And I came out of the theater and uh, everybody was looking up that direction. And I uh, looked over towards the old Rodeo grounds and there was a great plume of smoke just taking off. One of the uh, bombers, it was a Lockheed, uh, I th I'm thinking Vega Ventura or Hudson or something, uh, had made passes at an American airline transport right up over the Mount San Jacinto in that area at about 10, 11,000, 12,000 feet. And he uh, made three passes at him. On the third pass, took the back end of the airliner off and the airliner came in and a uh, complete war shot killed everybody on board right up um, Oh, uh, where the old Rodeo grounds is, I'm thinking um, the Las Palmas estates mm -hmm. on the side of the hill. We call it the old Rodeo grounds because there used to be a dry lake there and then we had Rodeos there and uh, you could sit on the side of the hill and no bleachers or anything and watch the Rodeo uh, on this little dry lake. Now there is a large rock retaining wall and um, uh, flood control. For, for the dry falls. It keeps that water from running through, down through the middle of town and across the reservation now. Here comes Mary. Clarence, would you talk a little bit about this photo? This one, Francis Stevens School, about 19, I'm guessing 1927. Uh, this is Palm Canyon Drive. This is Alejo, uh, the O'Donnell Golf Course. Uh, the vacant spot there, the Catholic Church is not there yet. Uh, this is Indian Avenue, which was a, a dirt street along here. The buildings, uh, the northern buildings of Francis Stevens are not built yet. Uh, that's where this uh, senior uh, citizen area is right at the present time. This little house here belonged to, uh, or uh, was for the use of uh, Mr. Rourke, who was a janitor who every kid in that school dearly loved. This was a little kind of a shelter, a pergola, and a and a little kitchen where we uh, we ate our lunch. Wasn't the Americanization room somewhere close to where Mr. Rourke's quarters were too? To the best of my knowledge, this was it right in this in this area. And that was the classroom where the um, Mexican children and Indian children spent the first few years of school. That's that's uh, the understanding I have. Yeah. Although I didn't know anything about it at the time, uh, it wasn't mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, right in this area here is where they parked the bus for the high school that took the kids to uh, to Banning each day. Oh. And uh, now the Americanization thing, uh, I I really didn't uh, didn't hear of that until later on. That came out with the interview with the right, the yeah, with with the uh, with the people, the younger people from the old original Mexican colony. Now you talked about Indian ponies and burros. Did they actually come close to where the school was to that, or where were they in relationship to? Uh, well, they were they were all over town. Uh, uh, the town itself was uh, not that big. 
uh, Indian Avenue was dirt. We go to Ramon Road. Ramon Road was dirt. The highway to uh, Indio uh, uh, was dirt. Um, at uh, starting at Ramon Road, and so the town was one little small area. But the the burros and the, and the horses, I understand, belonged to the Indians. The burros we we caught and uh, and rode. They were they were really fun. Some of them you could ride. Some of them you couldn't. Um, uh, but the experiences go on on forever. I thought I was a great burro rider, and <laughs> <laughs> but the burros were always smarter than we were. They a uh, 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 burro uh, down oh about at Andreas and Indian. That was a lot of mesquite in there at that time, uh, across the street from the old Hatchets campground. I can remember uh, getting on a burro one time, and he took me through that mesquite area, the bushes, and it had long thorns on it, and uh, the burrow won. <laughs> he, he finally drug me off under a limb, and boy was I cut up from the, the thorns. But I can remember, uh, we were speaking of the old Rodale grounds up um, uh, at the very west end by, by Dry Falls is where it was, and uh, we had Rodeos up there on the flat dry lake, and people sat uh, on the uh, the side of the hill as a, for bleachers. And I can remember they always have a clown uh, that has a burrow, a train burrow. And a burrow, I have nothing but respect for burrows. They are the smartest things. And they are the, the greatest friends. Uh, and they can be the honoriest son of a gun. <laughs> but this burrow was trained. And the guy would ask for a volunteer from the crowd to come out and ride his burrow. And you get $5. And I was the world's greatest burrow rider, I thought. So I would, I went out there, and he would climb on the burrow and ride it around, and he would invite anyone to come up. And he had that burrow trained that you didn't hit his back until you were on the ground. That burrow would throw you so quick. And then he also had him trained to, uh, and he would holler at you when you got on your feet. He said, "Run, run, run, run!" And the burrow would chase you, which was the big deal with the crowd, you know. But. I lit on my head. I still have a headache from one of those. <laughs> but I was, uh, I had learned to ride the burrows that roam the town, and uh, and some of the burrows we rode, and uh, and some we didn't. Well, Peggy, uh, or I tell you, said sometime at night you could hear the thundering of the hoofs of the of the horses, the yeah. ponies, and the burrows as they kind of roamed around. Yeah, they would they would come uh, come through town and uh, kick over all the garbage cans and uh, and. Uh, this this goes goes back. I don't know. All of a sudden, the burrows and, and the horses all disappeared. Somebody um, somebody either uh, there, a circus had come to town, and we always thought they sold them to the circus for <laughs> to feed the lions. But uh, we were little kids. Someone said that. I, I don't know what happened to them. But um, it was part of the town, and for all of us young kids, it was great. But to the adults, it wasn't very funny. <laughs> well. One other area that I wanted to talk to you about was the medical care when you moved to town. You moved here in 1928. Yeah. We had um, Dr. Reed and Dr. Hill, I believe, were doctors. Uh, they were, I believe they were house doctors for the hotel, too. Uh, Dr. Hill, I, let's see, Dr. Reed, I think, had the, uh, the Desert Inn, and um, I believe Dr. Hill must have um, had connections with the, um, I'm not sure about that, but uh, they each had younger doctors come in with them uh, later. Uh, Dr. Oliver came uh, and worked with Dr. Hill. Oliver was a real young man. He uh, recently passed away, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, real super guy. Um, I remember one night I got my finger wrecked in a movie projector and, uh, and he, uh, I was still in my teens, and he got out of bed and came down and told me what a dummy I was and fixed <laughs> the thing up. And uh, uh, But they would get out of bed in those days and uh, and come down for a minor little thing, uh, like a wrecked finger. Well, but there wasn't a hospital for a while. No. Dr. Reed, I understand, did have facilities up there for, um, uh, I think he delivered some babies in that uh, particular little hospital about where the Pepper Tree Inn is now. Mm -hmm. But other than that, um, we had no hospital uh, facilities. Um, uh, gosh, I remember 1941 even, we had a, um, 
an airplane accident. A very close friend of mine was killed on the old dirt field and uh, the girl with him was uh, seriously injured and uh, they sent an ambulance up from uh, from Indio mm -hmm. uh, but it had to come over a lousy road and uh, uh, slow time and they both died but um, uh, my son was born in uh, 1941 and he was delivered in Indio Hospital because we had no facilities here at that time and uh, uh, I, I, during World War II, I, th I think Tony General was, um, uh, I think the civilians were on emergency, uh, were allowed in mm -hmm. Tony General. Of course, our son was born there, but he was, um, he, he was born 1945, so he was mm -hmm. military. Uh, but then later, uh, after the war, uh, the Palm Springs District, somehow, I don't know what it was called, Palm Springs Hospital or something, anyway, they were allowed to use uh, one wing of the old El Mirador as uh, the Palm Springs Hospital and uh, our daughter was born there before the new hospital was was built but it uh, we called it the El Mirador what the heck but it was the uh, Palm Springs Hospital and then from there on my gosh what a hospital now that's some lots of changes oh boy for sure yeah. before you talked a little bit about the incorporation in 1938 when you think back, were there big changes because of the incorporation? Uh, I, uh, you know, uh, changes take place gradually. They, they fit right in. There were no real radical changes, instant changes that I can remember, except that we did uh, elect a, uh, uh, a city council, and um, out of that, uh, I think Phil Boyd was the first mayor of Palm Springs. I remember uh, Pop Shannon, uh, uh, who ran the old Vaughn Arms apartment, I think, was uh, was on that council, and I'm ashamed, but I can't, uh, because we knew everybody, uh, I, I can't remember the, the names of the people, but um, it was a pretty gutty thing to do. It always is. And surprising, the city of Palm Springs, now I have seen these other I saw Desert Hot Springs Incorporated and uh, Cathedral City Incorporated and Palm Desert. And right away, these people, the animosity builds up and you have two factions, they start to fight. But if I remember right, in Palm Springs, these people got along beautifully. Everybody was in there cooperating and uh, everybody was uh, friendly. I can remember no, uh, no great uh, mm -hmm. factions trying to take over this or that. But uh, the rest of these towns, uh, they can't get along with themselves, it seems. They're always... Uh, fight and, and uh, but uh, incorporation in Palm Springs uh, was a good thing. Yeah. Well, you just seem to have so many good and warm memories of growing up here. When you think of your family and even though it was depression time and all, are, would you st say generally you just have really pleasant memories? Pleasant memories because <laughs> you, you forget it's like being in the military. You forget the, the rotten things and you only remember the good things. I, I was talking to my mother uh, not long ago. Uh, she raised six kids and uh, washed diapers over a, a scrub board. I said, wouldn't it have been great to have had automatic washers and automatic uh, uh, dryers and to have a refrigerator? In those days we were lucky if we got ice in the ice box. We had no refrigeration at all. The desert cooler was whoever heard of the desert cooler. Mm -hmm. uh, people had some devices for putting a fan behind a burlap thing in a tub of water or something, but we had uh, none, none of the, what we call the swamp coolers, the desert coolers, the evaporators. We didn't have that. If you, if you were lucky, you had a fan. Uh, we slept outdoors under the trees and you put a leg of, uh, each leg of the bed in a can of water so the ants wouldn't crawl up the bed and, and get you. But uh, as a kid, uh, kids I think are more flexible anyway, it was um, happy, happy times. We loved it. Of course, we were dumb. We didn't know any better. <laughs> but uh, uh, my mother had come from Pasadena where she had a nice home and all the conveniences and uh, it uh, didn't get that hot. And, uh, and uh, it comes here where we had ice delivered. We had no ice house shouldn't say that. The Desert Inn did have ice making facilities and uh, they did sell ice in the summertime uh, to the public. You could go back there and, and pick up ice, but we didn't have ice delivery the way they did in, uh, you know, in the cities. Okay. And uh, it, 
and the, the houses were not insulated. We lived in little cabins with no ceilings even, you know. And it had to, it had to be miserable. But um, the people were rugged. Uh, we're talking about the old pioneers here in town. Uh, most of them lived uh, a tough age. My mother is 97 and still alive. And uh, so consequently, it, it must have been a hardening process and they survived. And did she develop uh, develop a group of friends, sort of a support group here too, in terms of moving here from Pasadena? Oh, yeah, right away. Uh, the school was always when you have kids in school, that is a uh, a, a spot where I, I can remember my mother being involved in friendly aid here in town, which uh, was like uh, Salvation Army. Somebody in trouble, you rounded up clothes and things like that, uh, and. The people that uh, that were involved, we knew all of them. Uh, they had kids in school. Uh, I think of Mrs. Bell. I think of Amy Croft, who I don't know. I think is still alive. She is. Uh, but uh, people like that, who uh, and uh, Nettie Redding and uh, Abby Ullman, people like that, who were um, just the solid citizens in town mm -hmm. that, uh, that just got involved in things. And Catherine Finchie was also involved in getting people. I know uh, Catherine Finchie and Dottie Stein, who was such a dear, dear friend and person. Uh, she uh, was involved in Girl Scouting, and I think the kids, um, uh, Peggy Ortega, Prieto, and, and that gang were all involved in the uh, in uh, Girl Scouting and that sort of thing. Dottie Stein started Mary Helen shop, didn't she? Dottie Stein. Mary Helen was in the same class in uh, elementary school with me, and uh, Oh, we all, we loved Mary Helen. She was a doll, and uh, Dottie uh, Dottie started uh, Mary Helen's uh, downtown in um, well the MDX drugstore, which was just torn mm -hmm. down. Uh, she had a store in that building, which mm -hmm. was uh, there were several stores that made up that building at that time. Yeah, Dottie Dottie uh, started that, and Mary Helen ran it, and then uh, later on, I think after World War II, she moved down uh, the street to. Um, approximately the location mm -hmm. where it is now. I guess it's still there. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yes, it is. But uh, Dottie, um, Dottie was one of the dear sweet people in this town. Uh, uh, Mary Helen died in uh, 1948, and uh, Dottie uh, had a couple of grandchildren from that marriage that held things together for her. But she, um, she lived and ran the shop until just a few years ago and then finally pulled out and then finally uh, things got too tough. She sold her home up on Potencia and moved into the uh, Oasis Hotel and, uh, and finally her granddaughter talked her into going to Texas. I didn't, I didn't get to say goodbye to her. She wrote me a couple of letters and uh, said she was sorry that uh, she didn't see me and then she died shortly after. It seems that people who live here so long will leave and they don't live very long afterwards. I don't know what it is. Something just goes. Their roots are really Yeah, here. their roots. But Dottie had lived here and uh, all her friends were here. Of course, uh, the granddaughter wanted her to live with her. And, but we were all sad to see her go. There was one last story that you told me that um, about um, somebody in town who had a neighbor who harassed her and that Ooh, <laughs> I, I really don't want to get into all names right, on that. Right. Uh, but, I, but you said there was, there was a tombstone Yes, there is a tombstone in the old cemetery. If someone searches into that, they'll find that uh, that uh, that's the way the town was way back. That someone and who was harassed to death by a neighbor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's still up there. <laughs> I, d I don't want to get into names. All right, that. okay, but that's, but that, that that's is a funny kind of a wonderful thing. It is a funny story. It probably wasn't to the guy that had the tombstone no, made, but, <laughs> but those people are all dead now. Uh, we could talk about it, but I don't think I will. <laughs> all, right. all right. Well, Clarence, it's just been it's been wonderful talking to you. I I want to thank you for sharing uh, a little bit about your early memories of Palm Springs, and particularly about your memories of aviation in Palm Springs. Thank you so much.